This is Rick Matson from the University of Washington Shoulder and Elbow Service. We're talking about how to do a total shoulder, and here are the final steps. So we've got our glenoid component in position uh, and securely fixed, and now we're going to finalize the preparation of the humerus. We use a cookie cutter to orient the fins for the brooch and for the humeral component. Then following that, we use a brooch that has a similar configuration to, bro to prepare the metaphysis for the component. If we see that the brooch is a little tight fitting in the uh, metaphysis, then we drop down a size because what we don't want to do is run the risk of a fracture here. So there are cases in which the humeral canal looks large and tempts us to use a large brooch, but that is not always advisable. And sometimes large canals uh, exist in older people that have osteoporosis, and that leaves us at risk for this kind of problem. So it's not a problem for us because we use impaction grafting for fixing our humeral component to drop down a diameter in the humeral stem and make up the difference with bone graft to protect the metaphysis. We trial the humeral component, and what we want is 50% posterior translation, as shown here. That gives us enough laxity for activities, but also enough stability so that the shoulder doesn't drop out of the back. We also use the drop back test. In other words, we flex the arm up at surgery and make sure it doesn't posteriorly decenter. And the third test is we check internal rotation and abduction, and we want about 60 degrees. So the arm is put out to the side, the arm is internally rotated about 60 degrees. If it's a lot more than that, we run the risk of there being posterior instability. If it's a lot less than that, then we run the risk that the shoulder is going to be too tight. So we have the advantage, as we've discussed a little bit before, of modulating the laxity once we have the glenoid component in place. We can do that by increasing the thickness of the humeral component or by using an anteriorly eccentric humeral component as shown here and here. <clears throat> we like to preserve the biceps because we believe that it contributes to shoulder stability. However, if the biceps is damaged, frayed, or partially detached, we do what we call an inside-out biceps tenodesis, in which case we complete the section of the biceps from the supraglenoid tubercle, run it through the humerus, out the humeral cut, and then fix it in position with the component. This is really a nice way to achieve secure fixation of the long head of the biceps without doing a soft tissue repair, uh, which may not be secure, or without having to worry about putting a button or some suture anchor in the humerus. We prepare uh, the uh, humerus for later subscapularis closure by putting six non-absorbable sutures uh, in the margin of the anterior neck cut, making sure that they go through secure bone. Then we do our impaction grafting, again, bone harvested from the resected humeral head. And uh, we continue to impact until we have good, secure fixation of the component. If necessary, we can actually adjust the position of the component with selective impaction grafting, so that if we want to keep the humerus from going into varus, we can add bones selectively immediately. Or if the humeral component wants to fall to the back, we can add bow graft in the back to push it forward. The nice thing about impaction grafting, it is enables you to manage a huge variety of humeral stem geometries um, with standard components. So even in the normal shoulder, you know that the canal is not circular. It's more like an ellipse and that the diameter of this uh, internal uh, geometry changes as we move from the top to the middle, to the bottom of the humerus. So it's really impossible to fit that with any kind of standard component. And on top of that, some canals are cylindrical and some are funnel-shaped and some are just 
playing crooked. So all of those can be managed with impaction grafting. And here's an example. And notice that this is a very osteopenic arm. In other words, the cortex is very thin and at risk for fracture. So we want to be very careful not to create any kind of endosteal notch. We also want to make sure that there is not any kind of diaphyseal incarceration. We're trying to put a really tight uh, stem in this fragile bone. And so here we've just put bone graft all around here and got great fixation that has created no problem for the patient. Here's a particular situation. Some people may say, gosh, you've got to use a short stem for that. But in a, after a fracture, uh, we found it pretty straightforward just to leave the plate on, shorten the screws, and use a small stem that goes down the humerus and uh, is well fixed with impaction grafting. Now, when it comes time to insert the humeral component, one of the things we want to be mindful of is the risk of contamination from TD bacterium that lives in the skin of patients, particularly young males. So what we do is we wrap the skin edge at the moment of uh, insertion with uh, a vancomycin-soaked sponge and are very careful to make sure that the prosthesis doesn't touch that skin edge. With respect to positioning, we want to make sure that the humeral head is just below what we call the berm, which is the edge of the uh, humeral neck cut as shown here and here. If the humeral head is too high uh, with respect to the berm, it can put a, extra tension on the uh, rotator cuff and can also interfere with complete seating of the humeral head into the glenoid. So when we talk about register, what we mean is that the ball fits exactly into the socket with the arm at the side or with the arm in abduction. And by being very careful to look at the register, we can see if that humeral component is too high or too low. <clears throat> we also want to make sure that there is no unwanted bone contact inferiorly. Here is a bone spur, and when that arm is adducted, you can see that that bone spur, spur uh, contacts the glenoid polyethylene. So we're very careful to check for that by adducting the arm and looking there, and we call that poo corner. We also are very careful to look for open booking. In other words, when the arm is externally rotated, we want to make sure that a posterior bony prominence or osteophyte doesn't cause the shoulder to lever open. Once we've made all these checks, we um, do the subscapularis repair, uh, making sure that the sutures that we placed previously pass through good quality subscapularis tendon. We then do a final motion check, looking for 40 degrees of external rotation, 50 degrees of posterior translation, and 60 degrees of internal rotation with the arm in abduction. If there's too much laxity, even at the last minute of the case, we can fine-tune this laxity by doing what's called a rotator interval plication. In this situation, what we do is simply close the upper subscapularis to the anterior supraspinatus using often four or five sutures, uh, as shown, he shown here from the top and as shown here from the front. And what we know is that the more of these sutures that are put in uh, place and the closer they are to the coracoid, the more stabilizing the uh, plication is. So that's a nice technique that we have at the end of the case when we've got everything there, but we say, huh, this shoulder looks a little bit too loose. Maybe we want to snug it up just a bit. So here's our final shoulder arthroplasty. Here's a case of glenoid arthritis, and here's a case of an impaction grafted thin stem with a nice um, glenoid component, again inserted with a uh, fluted central peg and a nice stable fixation two years after the procedure. Thank you.